I uh, mentioned recently that uh, one thing coming up was going to be some content on the 237. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple weeks ago, I showed a machine that I had picked up at a flea market, um, a 237, and that is not this machine. This machine does not belong to me. This machine belongs to a charming young lady named Pat. Up in, uh, She lives up in Union, New Jersey with her husband. And um, anyway, um, Pat wanted this particular machine service. She had two 237s, and uh, the idea was to combine the best parts of both machines and make one nice one. Well, the other machine she had, uh, it was, well, both machines, first of all, were complete. But the other machine she had just wasn't as pretty as this one was. Uh, it was a machine that she had picked up someplace, I don't know where. This particular machine was given to her by someone. Um, anyway, uh, the only fault I could find on this machine when I visited her the other day at her home was the... Uh, indicator plate, uh, which also has the uh, release mechanism for the upper thread tension, it has the bar in it for the release, uh, that was broken. So, uh, and it had been a, re a replacement part. The color wasn't right. And we looked at her other machine, and her other machine that was in perfect condition, so I swapped out those parts of the upper thread tension. And really, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot on this particular machine else that needed to be done except go through, check it, test it, and uh, give it a good cleaning uh, where it needs it, and lubrication. So there's a couple things I want to take apart and clean that I wasn't really comfortable or equipped for doing at her dining room table, which is where we did the other parts swap. So we agreed that I would take this machine, I would bring it back here to the shop. I have already put a new cogged belt on. That made a tremendous difference. She had one of those round rubber universal belts on there. Well, that's what that's what it had come with. Uh, we put a, a correct cogged belt on. This machine runs really, really well. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy with it, and I would be proud to add this one to my collection, but this one is not mine. So... Uh, let's go ahead. We're going to take the top off of her and we'll take the uh, nose cap off as well and we'll take a look inside because this machine is so much nicer than mine is. Anyway, uh, if you are following along at home and you have a 237, if you're a member of the... Um, Sewing Machine Resource Group on Facebook. I took a copy of, uh, I, have, I, I found a fairly decent copy of the Singer 237 service manual. It wasn't super clean. I imported all of it page by page into Photoshop. I cleaned it up, um, fixed the brightness and the contrast, made it so that each page size was eight and a half by 11 for standard U.S. letter size paper, and uh, put together a new PDF that is up on Sewing Machine Resource Group, um, where, um, you know, on Facebook. I'm also putting that, and it will be by the time I post this file, I'm also putting that on my website, so you'll be able to get it there, too, from the file section. Now, in addition to that, I also took... The exploded view, which was normally two pages in the um, in the manual, and I took the complete parts list, which was two pages in the manual, and I combined them all together in Photoshop to something that will print on a tabloid size piece of paper. And tabloid, if you're not familiar, that's 11 by 17 inches. And uh, so it's one big, one big like poster. Above is the uh, exploded view of the machine with every part numbered. And down below is the complete listing of all the parts. And believe it or not, you can read it all. It really came out nice. And uh, that too is on Sewing Machine Resource Group as well as on my website in the uh, manuals or the files section. So there'll be links to both of them down below. So anyway, we got this up, loosened up. We're going to take that off.
set that aside. And let me get the end piece off here so I can show you just how nice this machine is. But if you're following along and you want to see some of the procedures, go ahead, download that manual, and uh, print it out. Bind it up, you know, put it into a report binder or something. It's definitely a nice one to, uh, to keep if you are the owner or you intend to own a Singer 237. Now, before we go too much farther, I, got, I have to say, um, the, the 237 is probably one of the most underrated machines that Singer sold. Uh, they, they only made the 237, I think it was from 1967 to 1971. And one of the beautiful things about it, I'm going to lay her down on her back. Now I'm going to set the to a wide zigzag. Notice first up here, watch the action of the, uh, in the zigzag. Notice how the um, needle bar is pivoting. Okay, as I'm turning it over, you can see the needle bar moving. Watch what's happening down below. Let me lay this back down again. Specifically, watch what's happening here at the shuttle and the, uh, well here, let me zoom in on that for you. Now watch what happens when I'm turning this over. Watch how that's moving. The whole hook shuttle, the whole, and the bobbin case and everything moves back and forth. Now I'm not turning this very fast, obviously, but it turns back and forth for the zigzag, which means the uh, needle bar doesn't have to pivot when it's doing this. It's just moving solidly back and forth and everything is following along. This makes for an absolutely gorgeous zigzag stitch. And on many sewing machines that have zigzag, when you go to uh, use a zigzag stitch, quite often on a lot of machines, you have to mess with the upper thread tension. That is not necessary at all with a 237. 237, the machine, even though it may be zigzagging, it really seems like it's doing a straight stitch as far as the relationship between the needle bar, which stays perfectly vertical the whole time. And because the whole, the whole bobbin, uh, bobbin case, bobbin shuttle hook, whole, that's moving back and forth with it. So it's really a superior design. One thing that this machine does do that many lesser machines don't is you'll see here, I've got the feed dogs drop. Turn that, feed dogs are up. So if you're doing uh, darning work or if you put a um, buttonholer on, a buttonholer attachment on this, you don't have to put a cover plate on. Just turn the dial. Feed dogs are down, feed dogs are up. Couldn't be simpler, couldn't be better. It's a great, great little machine. Um, they're heavy. These are, these are big, heavy cast machines. These are not plastic body. Um, this is cast iron. And um, it does have a couple plastic parts. It's got a plastic, you know, the covers are plastic. But that, that, that body casting, that is cast iron. So uh, if you drop this on your foot, it's, your foot's going to stay dropped upon. But um, yeah, I love these machines. They are absolutely wonderful. I had one uh, a number of years ago and foolishly gave it away. Um, now that I own, own one again, I'm never going to get rid of it unless I get an even better one than the one I have. And the amount of work I'm putting into the one I have means I'm never going to get rid of it, if that makes sense. Anyway, um, I wanted to go ahead. Now we're going to start going through in the cleaning process. Get the presser foot off. I'm going to remove the um, needle plate. I'm just curious as to how much schmoo is underneath. And I don't suspect there's going to be much. Uh, looking at this machine at Pat's house, it looked pretty clean. So, and it's extremely clean. 
Yeah, there's nothing for me to do under there. That's that's fine. Um, pull the bobbin case up. Take a look at that. Um, yeah, we're going to we're going to clean the bobbin case out a little bit. Let me just first swab it out a little bit. Uh, I did try ch uh, testing the uh, bobbin case tension, and it seemed a little wonky. That, that, that there was some dirt under the spring. So we're going to be taking this apart and cleaning this. I wasn't getting a, a smooth pull. Uh, that might be the thread. There's not a whole heck of a lot on that bobbin. But it might have been that the, the thread had been on there for a long time or it was old thread or whatever. But there is the, the bobbin case inside is a little bit dirty. So we're going to go ahead and take this bobbin case apart. All right, this particular bobbin case design is a bit of a pain in the neck to take this slide off. Um, this slide and the latch are working fine, so we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to take the tension screw off, which is also what holds the whole thing together, and take off the spring so we can... Oh, we don't want to lose the screw. I'm going to set the screw up here, out of the way. we got the spring, and you can see... On the back side here of the spring, there's some schmoo, but even more importantly, on the case, there's some schmoo. So once we clean and polish this, that should resolve the uh, wonky tension issues that I was having when I was testing this. So I'm just going to take my rotary tool and some white compound and clean this up. take some paper towel and we'll just wipe off the buffing dirt and then we're going to attack the inside of the spring as well you know the part of the case that's in the thread path oh smooth there there we go now the buffing dirt's clear that looks considerably better now so, for the next portion of this, I'm going to take my small pair of non-marring pliers, but I need to use a different buffing wheel. That big buffing wheel I was just using will destroy that. So, let me get a different polishing point down from my collection O points. And uh, this one should do nicely. I have to put another order of polishing points in pretty soon. I actually go through those quite rapidly, those boxes of 100. Some sizes more than others, granted, but I do go through them. Okay, I'm going to put some white compound on this, and then we'll uh, get started. It's important, and I should point this out, I'm going to use a block of wood to help support, um, but it's important when you're doing this not to deform the spring in the process. So you kind of have to be very careful when doing this. Use two hands and support the spring. Very little, if any, pressure. over and get the other end of it. Okay, and then we'll take some paper towel and wipe the dirt off of it because that did, oh, look at that. Okay, hold on.
that cleaned up real nice on the inside. And uh, we'll go ahead and we'll polish the, the, the outside of it off as well. Actually, there's some schmoo on there. There we go. Once again, I'm going to hold it with my non-marring pliers. A little bit of white compound and very, very light pressure. Get the other side. That should do it, and then we'll wipe it off. And once again, a little bit of polishing compound and a hard felt polishing point did the trick. Now, there's a little bit of schmoo buffing dirt in here. I'm going to get that. You see it's coming off with a cotton swab. I couldn't get that with the paper towel. So I'll use cotton swab and get that off. And it's still in there. Buffing dirt is a funny thing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take I'm going to trim off a piece of this wooden stick and get that in there and use it like a little scraper. It's a little trick I picked up from watching Marshall at Wristwatch Revival. He uses what he calls peg wood. It's really nothing but a little... Uh, I think what, what he's using is birch. But just get in there with a little piece of... basically a small piece of a stick. And uh, these wooden stick Q-tips are great for that. I'm using my tiny, tiny screw starter from McMaster Carr. Let's see if I can get this screw started relatively easily. Maybe, maybe not. There it goes. It's going in. Getting these bobbin case screws started can sometimes be a royal pain in the neck. Alright, so we've got that in. Let me get a uh, bobbin case tension gauge and we're going to ballpark this. We're going to go ahead and test how clean we got this with my Toa TM2. This is the um, bobbin case tension gauge for 15 class machines. I want this to be at about 225 or so between 225 and 250 and that looks pretty darn good right there. So I think we're going to be okay. That's pretty close. It took a lot of cleaning on this bobbin case to get that to work well. Um, off camera I, I cleaned the interior a little bit more and um, polished it up and then I wound a new bobbin and things seem to be okay. Um, okay, before we go too much further, let me take the top back off. I had to put the top on to wind a bobbin, mainly because I was too lazy to go in the other room and wind one on another machine, but that's okay. Should be testing on the equipment we're working with anyway. Okay, in the uh, manual, as far as lubrication, they're showing internally a couple of points. I'm going to go move up to page four. Page four, they're showing back here. Let me turn the balance wheel around. There is an oil part, uh, an oil port at the connecting rod cap right here. They're indicating three drops. Um, what I would like to see in these that I don't see in them. I don't know if Singer had intended them to have wicks, but I like to see a little piece of wick in something like that. So I'm taking just a small piece. I'm going to insert some oil wick in there. Press it in really well. Bring that back up. And I'm going to saturate that wick 
and make that kind of self-oiling. Actually, let me trim that a little flush. Here we go. That's trimmed a little bit more flush. And now I'm just going to saturate the heck out of that felt oil wick. Let it work its way down. And we'll come back and put more on there as we go. Uh, they're also indicating there's another oil point oil port underneath the bobbin winder here. There is a hole. I'm going to take the bobbin winder off temporarily. Number one, I want to change that tire, but I also want to show you where the port is. So it's one screw here. And pardon my arm getting in the way, but here I'm going to lift that out. There is a washer that's underneath the uh, screw here. And here is that oil port right here. So that's lubricating the main shaft. That is accessible um, with the bobbin winder in place. I am going to change this tire. This tire is getting old and cracked. And it definitely needs a good... Uh, we definitely need a new one there. I grab the new tire and put the screw in the washer down here temporarily so I can get the tire on. Come on, you. On. There it goes. It's on nice and tight. We're going to go ahead and take a brush. Each one here. Just get some of this dirt moved around here a little bit. It's not that much actually. There really isn't much dirt in this machine. This machine is pretty darn clean inside. I'm going to go ahead and reinstall the bobbin winder. There we go. It's back on. It's got a brand new tire. That'll make Pat happy. All right, a top of the bobbin winder also calls for a drop, so we just put a drop on there, spin that around a little bit. And I'm going to take a piece of paper towel, just wipe off any excess. And walking, going by this, I'm going to put a couple more drops on that, let that soak into that felt. I'm going to be doing that consistently. They don't show lubrication there, but I like to lubricate my cams. I put a drop on either side of the cam. Um, okay, the zigzag assembly itself, is that holding tight? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, the stitch width assembly here, this runs dry. There's no need to put any oil in that. Likewise, the left and left, right, center needle position. There is no need to put any oil in that. That will work just fine as it is. These aren't things that are moving while the zigzag is operating. This here is sliding, but this can run dry. It's not going to, it doesn't need any, any lubrication there. That's fine. If you look at the lubrication diagram on page four of the manual, you'll see they want a drop of oil here. They want a drop of oil up here, over here, here, back here. They want a drop down here and a drop here. And they also want to make sure that you clean between the tension discs. Pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at the bottom. Oiling down on the bottom is a lot more involved than the oiling up top. Uh, let's start on this end of the machine. It's pretty much like any other 15 class machine and there's, there's a few extra spots we have to hit. Any of the pivot points, so here, here, down here, 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 in here, and in here, all those pivot points have to get hit. 
in addition, we've got some other spots here. Let me move the um, let me move the, the the hand wheel here a little bit so you can see the motion. We have to get in this point port here. That's an oil port. There's an oil port here. So we have this one and this one. We also need to lubricate this portion here that's the where the uh, feed dog drop happens you'll see how that mechanism moves we want to put a little bit of oil on that and we want a little bit of oil in between these two pieces here um, we also need to oil the cam down below the slider both sides of the slider we need to oil the ports the portion where the um, the uh, connecting rod is coming down from up top and where the feed uh, fork is coming through. Those have to be oiled. And let's see what else we've got here. Oh yes. They also want oil on that portion of the bushing. Strangely enough because it's going from there but we're going to but put it on both sides just to make sure it gets through. And uh, let's see. I think we pretty much got it. Yeah, those are pretty much all of the spots. Um, there's a lot of places on these to get just a drop. Just a drop. You don't need more than a drop. Now, I didn't necessarily hit them when I was pointing them. I was pointing, so I'm just going to go and I'm going to hit them now. Just a drop, just a drop, just a drop. And boom, that's all there is to it for lubrication. It's actually pretty simple. I've been asked to talk about timing a 237. Much like any of the 15 class straight stitch machines, such as the 15-91 or the 15-30, the timing is preset at the factory. This fork here, which drives via this uh, bearing block, moves this, uh, moves this arm. Well, this arm is pinned to this shaft. If we look inside the shuttle area, I'm going to pull the, the, the bobbin case and the shuttle out. The shuttle driver is also pinned to the shaft in here. There is no adjustment for timing. What we have is we have needle bar height. So this is preset, and they do a damn good job at the factory of making sure that these are in the right position. Let me go ahead and put the shuttle back in. That Oh, by the way, yes, the shuttle has this point on it here. That's the actual hook. So I'm going to put that back into the machine. I love the fact that on this, finally, Singer went with a, uh, a gated entryway to get in and out of, to get, to get the shuttle in and out for maintenance. It took them long enough to do that, but I'll take it. You'll see here on the needle bar, we have two marks, the upper and the lower mark. With the needle bar at its lowest position of travel, which, let me see if I can prop this up and maybe you can see that a little bit better. I've added some auxiliary lighting here to hopefully make it easier to see. At its lowest position of travel, that upper mark is even with the bottom of, the, uh, of this upper bushing. When we move that so that the lower mark is even with the bottom of the bushing, that's the point where we find that the body of the needle is even is in line, is directly opposite the point of the hook. Like any other, or should I say like the majority of Singer domestic sewing machines, at that point we, know, uh, we want the tip of the hook to be approximately 1 16th of an inch above the top of the eye of the needle. Now it's really difficult to show that with the feed dog in place, 
So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to take the feed dog out, I'm going to put a needle in this machine, and I'll be able to open up the gate and put the shuttle in position so you can see. So just give me a moment to get this all set for you to, so I can demonstrate that. I know you're not going to be able to see the timing marks here because of the extreme close-up I'm shooting, but I think it's more important for you to be able to see the relationship between the needle and the hook on the shuttle. So this is the shuttle right here where my tweezers are pointing. Obviously, that's the needle. Now I'm going to turn the machine, turn the balance wheel through in its normal, normal direction of rotation, and we're approaching the bottom of this of the mar of the travel that's the bottom of the needle bar travel here and now we're coming back up and that's the point where the lower timing mark is even with the bottom of that bushing and you'll notice that the machine is in fact in time where the point of the hook is directly behind the needle now you need something for scale in order to see this but the manual calls for the point of the hook to be approximately, operative word is approximately, one sixteenth of an inch above the top of the eye of the needle. So I'm going to scooch in here with a steel rule that's graduated in 30 seconds. And you'll be able to see two units of graduation here is a 30 second of an inch. So that's approximately a sixteenth of an inch. It might be off by just a little smudge, but it is close enough. Now, in order to get this so you can see that, I had to remove the cap spring over the, um, over the whole shuttle mechanism here. So the next thing I'm going to show you is how to get that back in place. And you're going to need uh, to gauge that because there is a specification for where this sits on top of the shuttle housing. That's the next thing I'm going to show you. The manual calls for the adjustments to be made with a number 14 needle, but there is one exception, and that is for the race cap. You have to have a number 18 needle installed for that, which I have now done. And with the screws that hold the race cap in place, I'm using a piece of 10 thousandths music wire as my gauge and I want the clearance between the needle and the race cap to be about ten thousandths which is about there so I get that in position and get the screw tightened on one side and then come back on this side and tighten the other screw. So that's the thread clearance for that particular portion here is ten thousandths of an inch. Now you're probably wondering, well, how am I going to get a gauge to you know ten thousandths? Um, my good friend uh, Mark Sumter at sish.com, he occasionally has sets of wire feeler gauges of available for thread clearance. Um, in his set, it doesn't come with a 10 thousandths. It comes with, I believe, an 11 and a 9. So you can use the 11 and 9 as go and no-goes. You're talking a thousandth of an inch. It's close enough. I happen to have a piece of 10 thousandths wire that I've used for this adjustment in the past. That's why I was able to do it with the with the correct size wire. But make sure if you do have if you do take this race cap off and you put it back on, make sure you have a number 18 needle. That's a big honking needle in there when you make that adjustment. Okay, that's as far as I'm going to go today on this particular uh, video on the 237. We're going to pick it up again on the 237 with other aspects of adjustments and um, maintenance, but we're not going to do it with this particular machine. This machine is going to go back to the customer. Uh, we'll do it with mine. So yeah, we're going to see from a couple of different angles, and you'll see how filthy mine is compared to this one. But anyway, that's what I've got for you for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.